Happy Sunday, First Church. Welcome to the podcast for First United Methodist Church of Austin, where we believe that every person is a beloved child of God on a journey to God with God. My name is Taylor First. My pronouns are she and her, and I am so glad that you're joining us for this time of worship through podcast. This is one of our two main worship opportunities at First Church during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our other worship opportunity happens live through Zoom on Sunday mornings, and that's an opportunity to really be gathered together, to see one another in all of our little Zoom Hollywood squares on the screen, and to let this body, this family of Christ, be as together as we can be, to greet one another, to sing together, to pray together, and to physically remember the presence of Christ with us, even as we are apart in this time. This podcast is an opportunity for us to hear God's word for this week together. It is a more contemplative time that you can tap into anytime you're ready on Sunday morning or later in that day or just another time later in the week. However we connect, We remember that God is still at work building community among us, filling that space between us and binding us together in Christ. I really believe that we will be surprised at how close we are to one another when we are finally able able to be physically together again. So make no mistake, friends, God is still at work. So as we gather around God's word, I invite you to get out a candle and light it or light that candle in your heart to remind you that the risen Christ is present with us wherever we go. Grab your Bible, open it to Deuteronomy. That's the fifth book of the Bible, so pretty close to the beginning. Deuteronomy chapter 14. And let's take a moment now to breathe deep and find our center before we open God's word. Let us pray. Steadfast God, we are grateful for the rhythm of days and weeks and years that match the steady pattern of your love for us. We find solace in the repetition of your promises. Our hope wells up when we remember that again and again you have chosen new life for us, even when we walk through darkness. Open us now to your word. Shine your light and help us to pattern our lives after the example you have given us in your word made flesh, Jesus. We ask in his name. Amen. A reading from Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 through 27. Set apart a tithe of all the yield of your seed that is brought in yearly from the field, in the presence of the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose as a dwelling for his name, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, your wine, and your oil, as well as the firstlings of your herd and flock, so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. But if, When the Lord your God has blessed you, the distance is so great that you are unable to transport it, because the place where the Lord your God will choose to set his name is too far away from you, then you may turn it into money. With the money secure in hand, 
Go to the place that the Lord your God will choose. Spend the money for whatever you wish, oxen, sheep, wine, strong drink, or whatever you desire. And you shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God, you and your household rejoicing together. As for the Levites resident in your towns, do not neglect them, because they have no allotment or inheritance with you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On this second Sunday of Easter, we are shifting into a new sermon series called A Strong Spirit in Troubled Times, and we're talking about the practices that sustain us. I have found, and perhaps you also have found, that the habits and disciplines that I keep on a regular basis become like an anchor in a storm. It's something steady that I can hang on to that keeps me grounded. During regular times, I, I keep the habits, but then during trying times, it kind of flips. It feels more like those habits keep me. They sustain me and hold me up. And this is especially true for the things that help me to connect with God. So we're going to spend this Eastertide season, these next six weeks, talking about these spiritual disciplines that can sustain us when life is a struggle the way that it is for most of us right now. And you may be thinking, well, isn't it too late for that? What good are these habits if I don't already have them built up in my life? But here's the thing. A time of great disruption is often the best time to start a new habit. When everything is already thrown up in the air and your usual patterns are not rolling like usual, starting a discipline now will help you set that new pattern in place so that it will become part of your new normal whenever things finally do normalize again. Now we often think of disciplines as something we practice alone or things that we have to withdraw from people in order to do. Many of these are the disciplines of abstinence. They involve taking away or withdrawing from the desires that drive all of us. Even those desires that are normal and legitimate like food and conversation, belongings or comfort. Disciplines of abstinence involve giving up the things that we desire for a period of time. So these are things like fasting, silence, frugality, or chastity. These disciplines help us to see where our normal desires can play too large a role in our lives. Or maybe they have outgrown our desire for God. So when we abstain, when we don't fulfill those desires, it creates this space in our lives. It creates a gap that gives us the room to engage in other activities that reset our souls, activities that center our lives on God again. And those other activities, those are the disciplines of engagement. Those are the things that we do that feed our spiritual lives and keep us close to God. So those are disciplines like study and worship, prayer, fellowship, and service. Usually those are things that we wish we did more of, that we did more regularly, but we just don't have the time because our lives are so full of the other stuff. So in this way, um, the author Dallas Willard describes these two types of disciplines, the disciplines of abstinence and the disciplines of engagement, like the outbreathing and inbreathing of our spiritual lives. So through abstaining, we breathe out the things that are um, crowding our spirits. And then that breathing out makes way for breathing in the new things that God can use to fill us up. And so he says, abstinence makes way for engagement. We're living in a period of time when we are all enduring this forced abstinence from a few things, right? We're forced to abstain from gathering together. 
we are all abstaining from certain aspects of work. Most of us are abstaining from commuting. We're abstaining from travel and um, often vacation. We're abstaining from meals eaten out and um, lots of treats like movies and concerts and sporting events. So what do we fill that space with? What can we engage in that will sync up the rhythm of our souls with the rhythm of God's heart? This is where we come to celebrating. Our scripture today comes from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means second law. It's basically a restatement of God's law. It repeats um, many of the same laws that we find in the book of Exodus, um, where Moses gives the people um, the law from Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy is basically the story of Moses trying to convince the people once again to follow God's law as they finally enter into the Holy Land. The book was actually written hundreds of years after that by scribes and priests who really hoped that it would inspire God's people to continue following God's law at a time when their nation was about to be conquered by a foreign power. So this book can be read on these two different levels, and yet either way, it is written for a people who are in the midst of struggle either wandering in the wilderness, searching for home, or having their homes and their security stripped away by conquest. Deuteronomy holds the laws, the practices, that will keep the people close to God in a time of crisis. These are meant to be the rhythms of their lives. So it's with that backdrop that we read God's command today. The command is to set apart a tithe. So in the past, worshipers were able to take their tithe offering of grain or livestock to many nearby places and to offer it there as a sacrifice for God. There were lots of options where you could do this, and there was bound to be one near you. This is how the ancient people worshipped. They offered this tithe, this um, offering that they took. And now, suddenly, things are changing. The new command centralizes things so that that sacrifice, that tithe offering, has to happen in one location that God will choose for the whole people. So, what if you and your land are a long way away from that one location. How are you supposed to worship then? How can you offer your tithe? Well, God makes a way. God commands the people to take that tithe, whether it's grain or wine or oil or animals, take that and sell it and turn the tithe into money. Then, with the money in hand, you are commanded to create a feast of celebration. Spend the money for whatever you wish, oxen, sheep, wine, even strong drink. We can only imagine what that would have been. Whatever you desire, it says, and you shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God, you and your household rejoicing together. Now admit it. With all of the 614 commands that God gives in the Hebrew law, you probably did not realize that one command would be celebration. God commanded the people to rejoice, to celebrate. It's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? Celebrating doesn't really seem much like a discipline. It it seems like a break from discipline until you get to a really trying, difficult time in life, a time when you are not at all inclined to celebrate, a time when you are inclined to skip celebrations or at least to set them aside until the storms of life have passed. Celebrating during tough times can feel like it's insensitive or it's wasteful. Plus, when life is hard, even our celebrations seem diminished. 
celebrating can even highlight what has been lost and make us feel that loss even more. And yet, here is God telling the people that in order to keep the rhythm of God's life, one of the ways that we stay connected to God is by celebrating. I experienced this personally last week with Easter. There was a part of me as a pastor that just kind of wanted to fold up Easter and put it in the file until we can really come back to it and celebrate it for real in the way that we really love to do all together with lilies and butterflies and trumpets and all the things. I kept wondering, how can we really make it feel like Easter now at a time like this? But we decided to keep the feast anyway. We kept to God's rhythm of Holy Week and Easter, and we did it up the very best that we could. And in doing so, we were reminded that resurrection life comes to us in any situation, any situation where Jesus is present and alive. And that has never been more true than now. That sweet sound of the organ and flying our own paper butterflies around our house or our um, porch on that sunny day, it reminded me for sure, hopefully you too, that God is bringing new life even now, every single day. My mom passed away a few days before my daughter's fourth birthday, and I'll be honest, there were moments when it felt so strange and almost wrong to be planning a celebration like a birthday in the midst of such a time of grief. But we did it anyway. And once we got to that day, our hearts just exploded with joy at the wonder of this precious child and the rhythm of another year of life that persists even in the face of death. It was keeping the celebration that actually reconnected us to God and to the joy that God gives. At times, celebration is a gritty practice, one that we undertake sometimes even with tears, recognizing loss in the midst of it, but hanging on to the hope that love and life will ultimately prevail. God commands God's people to celebrate not once and not once in a while, but really on the regular. So I wonder, during this pandemic time, are there celebrations that you have put off or set aside for now? Is there a way that you can celebrate and tap into the joy of living, using God's gifts to embody or live into that joy? I know a woman in our congregation who has lived alone for quite some time, and each year her birthday is different. She may have a special party or a dinner out with a friend. Um, some kind of special celebration that comes and goes. But every year, without fail, on her birthday, she goes to the store and she buys caviar and champagne. And she enjoys them in her own celebration of another year of life. It is this persistent celebration that she's able to um, embrace even on her own. Friends, God gives good gifts all the time. So let's make a practice of using some of those gifts to celebrate and remember that all of our celebrations point us back to God who gives and sustains life and who gives us a reason to celebrate for all of our days. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, give praise.
Now for our benediction each week, we are um, going to share in a blessing that our staff offers to one another each week at the end of our staff meeting. And so uh, if you've got the worship guide that we sent to you over email, then you have it in front of you. And so we would invite you to join us in saying it together. So let's share our benediction. May May the the peace peace of the the Lord Lord Christ Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.